look at Psalm chapter 147. We are a Bible church, and we do believe in the Bible. Can I get a hallelujah to that? So we're going to read the Bible this morning. In Psalm chapter 147. And in verse 2, the Bible says this. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted. Let me say that for those in the back. Let me say it again. He heals the broken heart. And binds up their wounds. He determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. Just think about that for a second. How miraculous is that? We know that there are billions and billions and billions of stars out there, and God knows each of them by name. And uh, I already know I, I messed up a couple of your names. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, we got like Aubrey and Aubrey and there's Anaya and then Leah apparently is Aaliyah. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, which one is which again? <laughs> it's hard enough for us to keep track of a hundred names, but yet God created all of the stars. And he knows them by each of their names. Verse 5. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. And the church said, Amen. God is a limitless God. And God is a powerful God. The title of the lesson this morning is simply the power of God. And I'm going to do my best to talk about the power of God in 30 minutes. Roger asked me this morning, what are you going to talk about? I said, the power of God. And he said, man, we don't have all day, bro. I said, don't worry, I'm going to do my best with the time given to me. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. The power of God. Romans 1 and verse 16. For the Bible says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Amen. The righteous will live by faith. That is the creed, if you would, of the righteous. To live by faith. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. In another translation, the dynamite of God. <laughs> Makes me think of uh, this guy, the guy who created dynamite, Alfred Nobel. You could say his invention was groundbreaking. <laughs> I am a dad, I get to say dad, dad jokes. <laughs> well, Alfred Nobel, the man who created dynamite, one day his brother died. And bad enough, he lost his brother. He read the, the newspaper the next day, and in the obituary, they put his name. They confused the brothers. So instead of his brother, they put Alfred Nobel, 
the merchant of death has finally died. The man who has earned a fortune of a prophet has finally died. Hooray! Was what the paper read. As you can imagine, Alfred Nobel that day was pretty humbled. The direct quote said, Dr. Alfred Nobel, who became rich by finding ways to kill more people faster than ever before, died yesterday. And the people celebrated. He was appalled. Imagine reading that. Imagine being in his shoes. He was absolutely appalled that he would be remembered this way. And so he decided to change his legacy. Wow. You know, not all of us get to read our own obituaries. Wow. <laughs> this man did by accident. <laughs> and he saw what his legacy was going to be and decided to make a change. So he started making contributions to science and to peace. And maybe you've heard of the Nobel Peace Prize. Wow. He started that. To encourage people to innovate to make the world a better place. And now that's what we remember him for. Wow. Nobel the man of peace, not the merchant of death. Wow. He changed his destiny. Wow. Well, what does your destiny look like? If your time were to come today, what would your obituary read? What would your legacy be? Is it something that you would be proud of? If not, you still have time to change your destiny. <laughs> Let's go to Matthew chapter 19. Right. This is going to be our main text for the morning. Matthew 19. And we're going to pick up in verse 16 here. Matthew 19, verse 16 says, Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Is that not the age-old question? What do I need to do to be saved? You ever had that question asked before? If you could meet Jesus face to face, what would be the first thing? Well, if you had one question, what would you ask him? I don't know what happened to the dinosaurs. <laughs> but yet this man, who had eternity on his mind and probably in his heart, was curious and maybe even questioned and wasn't sure of what his destiny had in store. So with the question burning in his heart, he comes to Jesus, what must I do to be saved? I think truly the question for the ages and what mankind has tried to answer for thousands of years and why we've created thousands of different doctrines and religions just trying to answer that on our own merit and understanding. Are you guys with me here? Look at Jesus' response. Verse 17, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. You see, Jesus is saying, look, there's only one, capital O, who is good. And you're saying, what good thing must I do to get to eternal life? He's trying to, he's helping him along here. He's like, he's starting to understand that there's something special about Jesus. He's more than just a carpenter. He's more than just a rabbi. Who is he? He's the son of God. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept. The young man said, what do I still lack? 
This is a great young man right here. He hasn't murdered. He hasn't committed adultery. He hasn't stolen. He hasn't given false testimony. He hasn't lied. He's honored his father and mother. And he's loved his neighbors as himself. This is a great young man. There's a lot of people in our world that can't say that they've been holding to that type of stuff their entire life. And he asked the question, what do I still lack? He knows that there's still something off there. I'm still missing, like I'm doing all these things right, but I can tell there is something off. You know, we are spiritual beings. And the Bible says that God has placed eternity in our hearts. And we see that laid out with this this example right here of this man. He's, he's questioning where he stands, and he knows that there's something missing, but he can't put his tongue onto it. So he goes to Jesus. And let me tell you what, Jesus got He's got all the answers. Amen. Amen. All these I have kept, what do I still lack? Verse 21. Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. He says, if you want to be perfect, aka what I see that you're lacking, go sell all your possessions. Go sell your house. Go sell your car. Go sell your phone. Give your clothes to the poor. Get rid of all your food. Sounds challenging. Go sell everything that you have. Give it all up. I don't care if you have a little or a lot. That sounds challenging. And he says, then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I've heard different explanations of this. Right, That the eye of the needle is this entryway into the, the city of Jerusalem back in ancient times. And in order for people and their camels to get into the city, you got to strip off all of the bags off your camel. The camel has to get onto it, uh, basically its arms <laughs> and make its way into Jerusalem. <laughs> Meaning that in the same way for us, we've got to be willing to give up all of our stuff and very humbly crawl ourselves, uh, crawl our way into the kingdom of God. I kind of like that explanation, but I also think Jesus might have been literal here when he says that it is, as e it is easier for a camel to make it through the eye of a needle. Anybody ever knitted here before? <laughs> <laughs> Harry, Jacob, and Katz? I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> you know, typically for Christmas, you get a knitted sweater from your mama, but don't be surprised if you get one from Katz, I guess. <laughs> and Jacob's going to get you with a nice little hat. <laughs> Harry's going to knit you some mittens. It's going to be so cute. <laughs> Well, Jesus says, nevertheless, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 25. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? They start thinking broader scope here. They're like, man, if it is that hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, who can make it? Like, that, that's their only problem? Is they're rich? That sounds like a pretty great problem to have. What about the tax collectors? And what about the prostitutes? What about the sinners? And what about me, just an average person? I might not be rich, but I got some sin in my life. Who then can be saved? 
Can I be saved? Can he be saved? Yeah. What about her? Come on. That's a great question. On, yeah. And look at what Jesus says. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. Could you imagine Jesus just looking at you and saying, with man, this is impossible. <laughs> but with God, all things are possible. Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or fields, for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much, and will inherit eternal life. Jesus says, you want to invest into something? Let me show you about the greatest investment you could ever make. And it's not your S&P 500, and it's not your 401k. But if you invest in God, you will receive a hundred times more than you could ever imagine. Verse 30, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. And the church said, Amen. Wow. There's so much to learn from this, I believe. We have this man who has his future, his eternity in question, and he comes to Jesus, asking him for help, asking him for direction. And I look into our world today, and I see a lot of people who are lost and aimless without direction. Confused and just trying to figure things out. And I know that's me from time to time. That was certainly me before I found Jesus, and that's even been me at times after I found Jesus. Where the world is big and confusing, life is confusing. And sometimes God's will and the purposes of God can be confusing in our lives. And Jesus says, look, if you want to be perfect, be willing to give up everything. And I think so often as people, we can make the excuse, I'm not perfect. That's right. That's why we have the Bible. If we were already perfect, there would be no reason, there would be no purpose for God's word. God's word would be very simple. It would say, keep on doing you, boo. <laughs> Seriously, God would say, there's, there's, you're doing all right. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Come on. We are not perfect. That's why we have direction from God. That's why God gives us direction. That's why he shows grace. But I think that the person that makes the excuse, I'm not perfect, is just trying to make an excuse to live the way that they live. I think it's either one of two things, either an excuse to live however we want to live, or it stems from a lack of faith thinking that we can change. You are not perfect, you are not Jesus, but you can become more like him. The weaknesses that you have can become strengths. The fear that you have can be turned into faith. And once you master this area of your life, God is going to allow another area of your life to spring up where you need help and where you need the power of God in your life. It is not by your own merit or your own good deeds or your own charisma that God loves you. God knows you even better than you know you. He knows your deepest, darkest thoughts. And the actions that you've committed behind closed doors. And guess what? He still loves you. He still loves you more than you can imagine. And that's more than any other person could say of you. And that's even more than you could say of you. Think about that for a second. 
God loves you more than you love you. He is the perfect father. He is the perfect creator. He has not abandoned you. He is a, a personal, he's not an impersonal God that's just floating from a distance and just lobbing uh, flaming arrows at us and laughing at us like a, like a little kid dumping a, a, a bottle of water on top of an anthill. God is a very loving, caring, and kind God. We will never be perfect, but we can't give up trying to be like Jesus every day. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's what we should strive for every day. And unfortunately, this example of this young man, this, this young rich man, he gave up. And he walked away sad. Because he knew what he had in store for him. What is impossible for man is possible with God. Now, I, I want to share a story with you guys of uh, this father that takes his son to the park. His little boy, we could say the little boy is uh, perhaps two years old. My son turns two next month. Takes his son to the park. And the little boy immediately just sees this perfect little sandbox. And the little boy runs over to the sandbox and starts playing, and the dad is just chilling some distance away on, the, on a bench watching him. And the little boy's building his sand castle, and he's having a great old time. And then he, as he's digging, he finds this big rock that's just obtruding his perfect little sanctuary of a sandbox. So he's like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get this rock out of here. So he digs it up. He gets the rock out of the sand. Okay, first step accomplished. Now let me get this rock to the edge of the box. And he starts dragging the box, the, edge, the rock to the edge of the, edge of the box. He gets it to the edge of the box, and it's a little lift that he has to now get it over. And he goes and he tries to pick up this giant rock. <laughs> and he keeps on trying, he tries a couple more times, face is all purple, starting to see stars, he can't lift it over, he's not strong enough. And the dad sees from the distance the, the explosion that's about to happen. The little boy is just trying and trying, and he can't get it. And after a while of trying, he just sits down and has a little meltdown. Starts to sob. The father comes over and says, son, what's wrong? And with his little two-year-old voice, I, I, I can't get the walk up to the sandbox. <laughs> Well, son, did you try with all of your strength? Yeah, dad, dad, I tried with all my strength. <laughs> it's just too heavy. No, son, you didn't. You didn't try with all your strength. You didn't use all the strength you had available to you. And the dad comes over. <laughs> and it's a good day again. The dad tosses the rock out of the sandbox. You know, we can be that, that little boy or that little girl trying to do things on our own strength, failing, crying about it. And then trying again and failing and crying about it. And we just simply cannot move the obstacles or the mountains in our life. 
but we're not using all the strength that we have available to us. You know, if we would just simply walk with God, we would have the power of God available to us. The power of God is that that raised people from the dead, that healed people of sickness and disease, and ultimately allowed us the opportunity as imperfect and sinful people to be saved and cleansed of our sin. Something that is impossible. We are undeserving of the grace that God is willing to just hand over to us. And all we got to do is to be that little boy or that little girl. Be willing to ask for the help. To just come to God and experience the power of God in our lives. I love you guys. Thank you very much. It's a God-given